Hello Kumba fans, Charlie with the Gossiker Application staff. Got another tip for you, 5-axis users. Today we're standing in front of an Akuma Genos M465AX. This guy is one of Akuma's hottest sellers, so we're pretty lucky to have one on our floor here in Cyprus. And so now would be a really good time to jump in and show some of the tools and tricks that Akuma gives us to keep our 5-axis machine in tip-top order. With a three-axis mill, it's very simple for the machine and operator to grasp where the part is located as the axis moves throughout their normal you know, travel range. Since all three axes are linear, the workpiece never really changes its orientation in space. Therefore, the, the kinematics are very simple to understand. Moving a single axis, for example, has no effect on the other two axes. Adding one or more rotary axes, however, complicates the kinematics as moving a rotary axis has a drastic change on the workpiece's orientation and the location in all three of the linear axes. As you can see, tracking where the part has reoriented in space is ultra critical. While the mathematics involved aren't horribly complicated, the result is dependent on knowing exactly where the point in space is about which the A and C axes pivot. Any difference between where the control calculates this pivot point and the actual pivot point causes a condition that we'll refer to as volumetric error. Now, the OSP control does give us some very powerful tools when it comes to tracking rotary axis motion and what happens to the part as these axes are put through their paces. Programs such as uh, dynamic fixture offset tracking, static fixture tracking, or tool center point control when you're in full five axis motion, they do a great job of calculating where this part has moved in space. But the data that it computes is only as good as A, the knowledge of where the exact center points of rotation are for both of the rotary axes, but also any outside factors such as gear lash or friction or inertia in a perfect world, none of these factors would exist, but we don't live in that perfect world yet. Yet, So instead of trying to change the laws of physics, the Akuma engineer sat down and made a great little piece of software that is going to allow us to very easily teach the machine where these center points are, as well as any abnormalities that it might occur during the rotation. That's what we're going to focus on today. It's called 5-axis auto-tune. Now before I launch the 5-axis auto-tune software, I want to start by making sure that my spindle probe is calibrated perfectly. Since this is a system that's going to affect the machine's performance down the road, I want to make sure I start off on the right foot. So I've got my RMP60 from Renishaw mounted in the spindle. I'm all set to calibrate it. I've already run a couple of videos that are on this channel regarding how to do this. So through the miracle of high-speed editing, let's do it really quick. Now that my spindle probe is all calibrated, I'm all set to start the software. My first step is going to take my calibration sphere. This is a 25 millimeter sphere on a mag base. It usually comes with the 5-axis auto-tune kit. I'm going to mount it directly to the table. And the rule of thumb is we need to be on the outside of a 150 millimeter radius. If that sphere is mounted a little closer in, the accuracy of the uh, software may suffer a little bit. Also, if we get too close, the software will warn us and say, hey, wait a second, wait a second, this just isn't going to work. If you think about it, if my sphere is too close to the center of the table, the deviation isn't enough for the control to make the calculations. But we're all the way on the outside of the table here, and that should be just fine for us. My next step is to disable the software that Akuma uses to track the rotary axis motion. First step is to touch the parameter page. And I have several videos that talk about navigating this, so I'll skip through a couple of the, the basic steps. The parameter that I'm looking for is called the geometric compensation parameter. Right there on top, we can see geometric compensation is currently turned on, which means the software is actively tracking the abnormalities that were discovered the last time that this was run. We don't want that turned on right now 
because we, are, we want to find out what's actually varying in our axis motion, not what is different between actual and what it thinks is actual. Well, that got confusing quick, didn't it? Let's just turn it off and be happy we did. First step is going to be to emergency stop the machine. It will generate an alarm if you haven't done that. We'll make sure the geometric compensation is highlighted. I'll push the menu on and turn it off. I can now release the emergency stop and come back to my main screen and the geometric compensation will not be active for anything that we do from now until we turn that back on. Now I'm ready to use the manual pulse generator and to position the spindle probe roughly eyeballed to the center of the sphere and within three millimeters from touching the top. We don't have to be exact, just an eyeball should be good enough. There we are, roughly eyeballed XY center. The A axis is at zero, so it should be perfectly flat. C axis is irrelevant, and we're about three millimeters from the top of the sphere in Z. Now we'll switch into MDI mode. I don't have the word display change showing on the screen right now, but if I arrow over one time, it'll show up above F7. By touching display change, I can then find the parameter or the page for geometric measurement, and then I can close my pop-up window. Currently, my measurement mode is set to full, and I like to leave it that way. Sure, it takes a little longer than, uh, than it has to, but because we're doing calibration, we want this to be as accurate as possible. And you'll notice down here, it gives us a step-by-step -step on exactly what we're supposed to do. Step one, fix the target sphere on the table. We did that. Step two, position a probe near the Z plus vertex of the sphere. We took care of that. Change mode to MDI. We're good. Press the F6 start measure. So here is my F6 start measure. When I push it, it automatically populates a call statement into the MDI buffer. And now we're ready to hit cycle start and execute the measurement program. As soon as I push the cycle start button, the spindle retracts ever so slightly, fluctuates my, my rotary axes in order to uh, take out any gear lash. And now it's going to go through a process of double checking my spindle probe calibration. Notice it's starting a good distance off of the sphere and it's indexing the spindle probe around just to make sure that I really did do my, uh, my true and running checks properly and that uh, my spindle probe is indeed calibrated as it's supposed to be. Once it has completed these four touches around the perimeter of the sphere, it'll then do more measurements and you notice that this time it's a lot closer to the sphere with each one of the touches. Now we can just sit back and relax as the machine goes through 29 individual touches of the sphere and rotating of the rotary axes to track the motion as it uh, is completed. Super speed mode? Yeah, we can do that.
Now that we've finished, it'll tell us that, okay, we finished. It took about 12 minutes and 20 seconds, and we can check our results on the next page. So I'm going to use the page down button, and here are our results. They all look pretty close to being inside spec. My result is a volumetric error of 0.076 millimeters. It's pretty tight. Once I turn on my geometric parameter, it'll be down to 0.006 millimeters, which is just phenomenal. So I love it. Now I'll be able to go back into my parameters. With the e-stop pressed, I will turn geometric parameters back on. Release my emergency stop. And now my machine is up to date and happy. So now that we're finished, the next logical question is, hey, Charlie, how often should I do this? Go ahead. Hey, Charlie, how often should... Just kidding. I recommend to customers do this at least once a month just to keep your machine in tip-top shape. However, if you're having some, oh, some results that you aren't expected, feel free to bust it out. As you saw, it only takes about 15 minutes to get the entire thing set up and run. So there's no harm in running it more frequently, but once a month should be enough to keep your machine jazzy and tip top. Thanks for watching. Uh, look forward to a couple new videos that will be coming out this month regarding the tool center point control and dynamic fixture offset tracking related to exactly what we just did, but we'll get to use them. Have a great one and be safe out there.